Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have Valentina Zarkova here. And uh, Valentina, could you tell us a little bit about yourself to get us started? Yes, um, I'm Emeritus Professor at the University of Northumbria, Newcastle, and the director of the research company ZVS Research Enterprise. So I've been doing research in solar and plasma physics and um, came up mostly in energetic particles coming from the sun to the earth and heating. But um, at some stage, I started doing this general solar activity related to sunspots. So these are the part which we probably will be speaking today because um, despite we've done quite a few things in energetic particles, discovering sunquakes, people who uh, were born before a millennium in 1998, they had... Uh, big headlines in all the media. We discovered sunquakes on the sun. Paper was published in Nature and um, uh, this have our work become known and solar terrestrial physics came to the media. After that, there were many different discoveries, not by us, but some others, but nonetheless, this is the part we started. And um, in 2002, we got European project funding for European Grid of Solar Observation started investigating sunspots. So the sunspots are the dark spots on the solar surface look like that. So the sun is the orange circle in which you have these dark spots, which you close up. If you look at the bottom, they look like this with the umbra in center and penumbra around. And what has happened during this solar, the, the sunspot occur over the 11 year solar cycle, uh, somewhere starting at the 30, 40 degrees plus minus south and north, and then slowly migrate towards the equator. So these are the sunspots which were selected to define the solar activity. So many of you seen this um, nice pictures of current solar activity index which called average daily sunspot number or sunspot areas. And at the, the bottom, it shows you the average sunspot numbers from 1870, but we have now the data from 1700. And uh, on the top, we show you butterfly diagrams of the places where uh, the sunspots start occurring at the beginning of the cycle each vertical line. This is beginning of the cycle. The sunspot appear on the surface, and over the cycle, eleven years between here and here, they slowly migrate toward the equator. And this um, latitudinal distribution called um, the butterfly diagrams. So this is the activity which was defined in eighteen nineteen centuries by Wolf and other people, and this is what we were using for now as well. What um, appeared at the beginning of 20th century, that these dark spots, actually, not simply dark spots, they are places where magnetic loops are embedded into the photosphere or the surface of the sun. So basically, this is what you see as a sunspot, but in reality, these are the roots of two foot points of the loop, magnetic loop with different polarity. So this uh, became possible when Babcock invented magnetograph and they started measuring magnetic field of the sun and discovered this beautiful thing. So after that, it was beginning of um, somewhere maybe beginning of 20th century, 30s, 40s. And uh, then people try to understand why this uh, sunspot suddenly migrate into the equator. And um, the magnetic field in sunspots was 1,000 times higher than surrounding area. And they always come in pairs, which explains why, because they are part of the, this loop. So 
all sunspots in the same hemisphere have the same magnetic configuration. So leading sunspot have leading polarity and the trailing has um, trailing polarity. So this is came up, so the sunspot cycle turned out to be about 11 years. And with the space observation of sunspot cycle, mm. we can observe that during this part, not only on the photosphere with the sunspot, but also in the corona, the emission, these loops become very activated. So this is on the top minimum, 1996 minimum of solar cycles. We don't have many much activity. But when you come to 1999, 2000, at the bottom of this picture, you see that the image of the sun in soft X-ray shows a lot of active magnetic loops, which are burning and sending emission to the Earth and other planets. So this is the action of solar activity through sunspots and magnetic loops, which show the food point as sunspots. What uh, happened um, in 1955, Eugene Parker uh, came up with the idea of solar dynamo, which actually handles this occurrence of sunspots. So basically what he was uh, produced the theory why the magnetic field is changing. So at the start of the cycle, like north is the northern hemisphere polarity, and magnetic field southern in the southern hemisphere polarity. So this magnetic field uh, produces a lot of at the bottom of the uh, solar convective zone somewhere in the solar interior produces a lot of those magnetic loops, which travel from the solar minimum towards the solar maximum. So this middle plot shows you solar maximum when these loops eventually appear on the surface. And what they do, they basically appear and show the migration of the magnetic polarity southern to the north and northern to the south. So this, um, because the sun rotates about its axis and its rotation is not uh, smooth, it's faster rotation on the equator and slower on uh, near the poles. So all these loops, all these magnetic fields started twisted and um, they appear on the surface and create a lot of act active region on the top and allowing mi migrate the field southern polarity to the north and northern to the south. And when they arrive to the next solar cycle, all this loop disappear from the surface. You see there were loops and the solar active stage when the solar was in maximum solar activity. And when you come to the next minimum, all this loop disappear. We don't have sunspots. This is the minimum activity. But what happened that polarity from thousand on the south moved to the north. Now the northern pole has thousand polarity and thousand pole has north polarity. And in the next cycle, solar dynamo repeats the process again. So this is how um, been developed and this been many times um, improved. The solar dynamo theory is um, flourishing and developing very dramatically with this um, investigation. And uh, we started dealing with this when we did uh, automated feature extraction on this solar image. So what you get, you get all image of the sun. And previously, all these uh, butterfly diagrams or uh, average sunspot numbers per month were calculated from the drawing. When we came to the digital era, we decided that possibly it's easier to probably uh, detect these sunspots automatically and introduce automated sunspot index. So this is what we've done. My group did automated feature extraction. So we extracted these big ones, active region, these red ones, filaments, 
And these tiny ones, these are the sunspots in the active region, which we now know. These are food points of the uh, active region loops. So we managed to do this, and this is the close up how they look like. So this is active region, these are sunspots. We produce uh, 100,000 of features and try to introduce automated um, solar feature cut, uh, automated um, uh, detection of uh, solar activity index. So this is what, what we done at that time. But the problem was that we couldn't do it so much automated because there were many um, specific options which depends on the observer. It depends on the class, and this is why it was not possible to reproduce the solar activity index with automated detection. Despite we have all possible materials, you have you can extract from digital image. So we look at that. We thought probably the sunspots do not give you enough information because they cover on the small area on the sun. So the error bars in that detection is very huge. So we decided to compare the sunspot magnetic field at the bottom with the background magnetic field of the sun. And we found that actually they're strongly dependent. So where the sunspot polarity is, for example, negative, like in the bottom here, the background magnetic field polarity should be positive. So Basically, the background magnetic field seems like modulates where the sunspot could appear on the surface and how they migrate toward the pole. This is what we discovered in this paper, 2008. And after that, we decided to use these um, full disk magnetograms for introducing a new solar activity index. So what basically we did, instead of automating detection of sunspot index, which we found very difficult to automate because it depends on the agreement between people. It's much easier it was to deal with the magnetic field of the whole sun. So, but we see that the activity on the sun has a wavy process, has 11 years minimum period of different activity, 11th year cycle. How do we detect the waves? So we look back at the very famous um, um, glass prism. Remember this white light coming on the left-hand side and diffraction of the prism of the light of different wavelengths immediately produces on the right-hand side rainbow with the spectrum from red to indigo and the, the device which produces the spectrum is this um, diffraction in the glass prism. So we thought what we can use as a prism for magnetic field, what can help us to define the way. So we discovered that magnetic field can be similarly separated into separate components with the principal component analysis. So this is what we used. And when we apply to the full disk magnetogram principal component analysis, we discovered this um, precise method. This is not the method which uh, uses any artificial intelligence. Everyone who deals with waves, they know that eigenvectors, eigenvalues, are always assigned to any waves. So second order differential equation produces all this couple of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is the same we done, but in our case, we had a number, not only two, but but much larger number of these um, uh, eigenvectors or vectors of own oscillations of the sun. What is unpredicted, what we found that all these vectors come in pairs. So you see the first two become uh, here, one is 39. We, we divided this eigenvalues by uh, variance of the data assigned to this particular vector. So for these two vectors, we can assign the variance about 
So 39%, about 40% of variance. It gives you 67% of data by standard deviation. So this is pretty large, big piece of data defined by these eigenvectors. And then the next eigenvectors, we recently investigated them in paper in 2000, 2022. This is uh, another pair of the vectors, you see? They again come in pairs and in pairs, at least you have eight eigenvectors or four pairs which are linked. And we assigned, we discovered that these uh, eigenvectors are assigned to dipole magnetic source, the largest one. We call them principal components. And then you have quadruple magnetic sources, waves produced by quadruple, sextuple, and octuple magnetic sources. And they cover 95% of all magnetic data. So you see the principle worked. Principal component allowed us to find some component of magnetic field. So how we look at them. So on the left hand side, we produce this component. This is one component. This is another one. What we found that each component starts in opposite hemisphere, but then they together travel in the northern hemisphere in the odd cycles, in the southern hemisphere in the even cycles. And when they meet, or the amplitudes become close, it, the maximum of solar activity occurs. So this is uh, the two principal components, which we derived from the cycle 21, 22, 23 from magnetic field. And um, then what we did, we managed to quantify this component. So it, there were two ways you can, use artificial intelligence, whatever neural networks or others, and assign these uh, some um, in memory, producing the uh, prediction of this, how these uh, components will develop. What we managed, we used the um, so-called Eureka um, prediction with Hamiltonian approach, which we managed to quantify analytically these um, two curves. And then we predicted them. So this is the solid line, our analytical prediction and dashed line. This is a real measurement because by the time we predicted worth about six or five, seven years came. So we could use this data to compare. And we found that prediction and um, uh, the real um, behavior are very close. This is why we calculated this curve to the cycle 26. And this is what we see. So what you can now see clearly when you look prediction. So this cycle 24, which left behind, we have the moment in cycle 25 and somewhere approaching the maximum solar activity. And what you can see here that in this cycle 25, um, the components of these two eigenvectors are coming a little bit delayed in phase. And in cycle 26, the amplitudes of components are in nearly in anti-phase. What it means? Um, this means um, very known effect, beating effect in the waves, which each of you who have piano and invited engineer to feed your piano, your piano engineer hit the fork and hit the button on the piano and hear the sound. If the sound, the frequency is the same, he hears the same sound. If the frequency is slightly different, what will happen that the, mm, <laughs> the wave basically will have beat effects. So you'll have a little bit envelope variation of amplitude. It means that he needs to fix the amplitude of one of the, in the piano to fit the frequency to the one to the fork. On the sound, we don't have engineer. So we have to have this uh, variation of amplitude and reduction of amplitude during 
ground solar minimum. And you see in the cycle 26, when you calculate the resulting curve from the previous one, so if you add this components all together and calculate the summary curve. So you calculate what you see, this is cycle 21, amplitude pretty high, cycle 22, amplitude is reducing, 23 reduced, 24, 25 slightly reduced, and then in cycle 26, amplitude will be very low. This is what I call this beating effect because the frequency of these two waves are close to 11 years, but slightly different. And difference gives you um, uh, this beating effect, which caused by the at cosine A plus cosine B. If you look at the trigonometric formula, how you do cosine A plus cosine B, you will see that beating effect comes from this envelope frequency A my, minus B divided by two. This is will be. So anyway, this is first time. It was 2015 paper in scientific research when we discovered that um, amplitude of solar activity is reducing towards cycle 26. And um, not dramatically in cycle 25, but it will be much stronger cycle 26. So we wanted to see how this amplitude will behave on the larger scale, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 years. And what this amplitude means, what, what, what this um, curve, what does it mean? So in order to compare with the sunspots, what we did, we reflected. So our negative magnetic field was the southern polarity, positive northern polarity. So we say that everything will be positive. And like mirror reflect this to the top. If we reflect everything to the top with the modulus of um, this curve, we obtain this. We obtain this is red, our average sunspot numbers. And the black ones are, this is my summary curve, but modulus summary curve reflected to the positive. So you see it more or less, describes the solar activity. This is what gave us clue. Aha, uh -huh. this uh, magnetic field summary curve actually is related to the solar activity index somehow. We do not say this exactly the same one because this is a different field. It is poloidal field of the background sun while the uh, magnetic field in sunspot, it is toroidal field of magnetic loops, but nonetheless, they should be uh, related. And what now we can build modulus summary curve for all the cycles, which I presented before, cycle 21, 22, 23, 24 and 25, you see there are not much difference between amplitude cycle 24, 25, but it will be much difference in cycle 26 when amplitude drops down. And some people already also reported that the amplitude of solar activity will be reducing in cycle 25, 26. So we done published paper recently. We Our prediction, this is the cycle 24, which at that time we didn't have, but now we had it. We use it and the prediction is uh, corresponding to the what is measured, so which is nice. Confirm. So what basically now we could calculate this uh, summary curve for 2000 years from 1200 to 3200. And you see beauty of it, yeah? You see that this is the envelope frequency. Remember that one beating effect. So if you have two waves, one wave has cosine A, and another wave is cosine B, when you add these two waves and A not equal to B, the envelope amplitude frequency will be A minus B by two. And this is the envelope amplitude which create ground solar cycle. While the um, frequency of this 11 year cycle will be A plus B divided by two. If difference is not big, it will be still 11 year cycle. 
So this is what we discovered. This is the part which we used for our detection. This is, we discovered that we, on the approach of grand solar minimum, modern grand solar minimum, and there were previous grand solar minimum, Mounder grand solar minimum, Dalton minimum, Wolf minimum, and some, some others. So this is was done in 2015. And suddenly we realized that we are in the verge of coming to mini ice age, which obviously was a huge um, objection from people who were promoting anthropogenic global warming because uh, it is very inconvenient what they say and the temperature is increasing. What we are saying, the temperature actually the, from after we pass the maximum of cycle 25, the temperature will be decreasing because solar activity will stop very dramatic and the sun will stop firing these active regions and these loops and flares and stop sending radiation to, to the Earth and other planets. Do you wish to ask anything? Well, I'm just curious if you can quantify it at all as to how much cooling we might see between now and this predicted minimum. And when would that happen, that minimum? Uh, it it started already. I actually, these are results um, where we reported our um, results at the uh, press release of National Astronomy Meeting 2015 and media, YouTube. So if you type mini ice age and my name, you will find all this relationship. And in my web page in the Solar News somewhere at the very bottom, there are this data from seven years old. So what, you know, this we try to do verification. Uh, we look at the minima in the past and our curve. So our curve is blue. And uh, what we found that actually with this formula, we hit mountain minimum, wolf minimum, award minimum, even Homeric minimum during the Roman Empire. So basically, it more or less reproduces well, given that we had not much data, but because it is a precise method uh, of egg and vectors, so it is not artificial intelligence, not de de dependent on our wish or something. It's precise method. So we, we got from the data, we got this pretty precise formula. Uh, how much it is will be reduced? So if you remember, I will show you. Uh, so these are the periods which we managed to hit. The only difference we couldn't get the spur minimum, which is over here, the push spur minimum, which we found that the spur minimum actually was not the minimum of solar activity. It was the maximum solar activity because at the minute when you had the spur minimum, the temperature on Earth was very high. But what happened at that time during spur minimum, it was the explosion of huge supernova, uh, Vela Junior which was in the Southern Hemisphere, um, somewhere 55 um, degrees of the Southern ecliptical latitude. And this is why most of those observers on the North haven't seen it. What it changed, it changed the, the background of the radiation of cosmic rays coming to Earth. And this is why people who calculate here, the uh, minima maxima from radio isotopes in the trees or something, they use as a background for calculate the age. But Libby, the guy who invented how to calculate the age, he warned that changing the background is very important, or knowing background is very important. So if at that time, it was explosion of supernova, which was only 600 light years close to the Earth. So the huge increase of the 
uh, gamma ray emission coming from the supernova increased uh, background cosmic rays in the Earth, which basically, if you look at that, led to the huge explosion and uh, auroras on the Earth at that time. Aurora was seen in the 14th, 15th century at the level of Mediterranean. So the auroras were so strong, they seen at the level of Mediterranean, which means that at that time background and the radiation, gamma ray radiation coming from the supernova. This is why it's recorded as a uh, like minimum because background was um, affecting the date, but probably this minimum would probably refer because of the time error produced the, by their own background. So this minimum referred either to this one or to the previous one. So this is the only one which uh, did not come up. But now we speak about the temperature. I skip the modeling of this uh, probably nice effect explaining your beating effect. So this is how you calculate uh, sum of two cosine. It will be sine of difference frequencies multiplied by sine of sum of the frequency. And this is the sign which produces this envelope frequency. It, uh, this is from my lecture note for, for the students of the first year about uh, waves. <laughs> So anyway, this is the thing which we could manage to produce with the modeling of solar dynamo. On the top is the model waves, and at the bottom is what we derived from the observation. So you should understand that everything we derive as principal component, it's not a model. You derive straight from the observation. And only after that, we produce the model which managed to explain these observations. And uh, what I would say, jump, jump to the temperatures if you want to see. So this is how the temperature is changing. In mount, during mounted minimum, the temperature reduced, average temperature reduced by one degree, which is probably the amount which we would expect for cycle 26. So the temperature will be reduced. It will not be that wide because the modern ground minimum on the three solar cycles, the temperature already be, begun decreasing, but it will decrease probably by one degree. It was um, decreasing during all minima or Dalton minima as well, but this is the amount you would expect so reduction of um, solar irradiance by about three watt per square meters would re lead to the decrease of about um, one degree. So how it happened, the decrease, there's Schindel et al. 2001 in science that published. So the surface temperature at Earth will re was reduced during Mount the Minima and Europe, North America went into a deep freeze. So they restored the temperature and found this, this is published in their paper 2001. I don't know why um, many scientists now forgotten, but this is good research done 20 years ago. And this is absolutely correct. At that time, when we had Mount the Minimal, Alpine glaciers extended over valley farmland. You see sea ice scrap south from Arctic, Dunap, and Thames rivers and canals frozen. So basically, how does it happen? What happened during this Grand Solar Memo? The changing of the jet stream. So without Grand Solar Memo, without magnetic field change, our jet stream is straight. Here is the whole stream. Here this equator, beautiful. But then when you have a reduction of magnetic field, then less ozone will be affected planetary atmosphere waves, and then they will produce giant wiggles in here. And these jet streams affect the normal uh, standard jets and uh, will be kicked North Atlantic oscillation. And this is how the temperatures reduce. So 
Reduction of magnetic field on the sun is the consequence for the Earth and other planets. It's like this. It was investigated by NASA scientists, which now they pretend they forgot them, but it doesn't go anywhere. So what is happening with the current cycle? This is taken a few days ago from a Belgian, Royal Be Belgian Observatory, which show you the green line shows the steep growth of number spotless days in cycle 25, current cycle, compared with any other cycles since we started observing sunspots. And what you can see, the cycle 25 shows a very sharp increase of number spotless days. So it doesn't matter it is at the moment at the maximum. We need to survive two, three years when the cycle passes through maximum and start going to the descending phase where the whole mini ice age will start acting very dramatically. But you see indication that this cycle is promising to be pretty much very strong one, spotless, which means absent of spots, it's absent of these active loops, remember? loops which are embedded into the surface, their spots. So if there are no spots, there are no loops embedded. And these loops interacting, they produce flares, they produce energetic particles, which are sent to the uh, Earth and other atmospheres and heat them and produce heating for us. If they are not present, there's no heating. So this is what happened. And this would um, coming up very soon. And the temperatures, for example, even measurement of the temperature here, the temperature is re reducing in June 2022, reduced um, uh, dramatically, slightly increased uh, in June, but not much. So the temperature started decreasing. It is uh, post difficult, to know. even if we had a couple of hot days, I explained why we have the hot days, because it's still another process, but for time being, in the next 30 years, the global warming probably will be last thing in our mind because it will be many ice age, which will require a lot of heating because it will be cold. And let me show here. It was um, recorded in July. 19 in Ukraine in Carpathian Mountain, they had snow. They also had snow this August. August snow in mountains which are not very high. So 2021, very much snow. In January 2020, it was snow and frost minus two recorded in Amman uh, Kingdom, Arabia, first time in 150 years. And this is will become in much more frequently. Early snow in Canada, September 20, May 21. So we will see this is coming towards us and this is will produce a um, uh, decrease of the temperature. So what we now actually enjoy in that sun is the maximum of cycle 25. So two, three years while these loops are still on the sun and heating, we have the heating. But as soon as the sun switches off these loops, you will see what happened. What happened, what exactly happened during Mount the Minimum. Okay. Are you satisfied? I am. This is super interesting. Yeah. Very is it? Very you didn't... interesting. <laughs> so here are the examples, um, storms, uh, winter storms in Colombia. And uh, now NASA appear agree that full-blown grand solar minimum in the late 2020s will be here, indeed. So as soon as we pass maximum of cycle 25, 2024, 2025, then we will be actually heading with the full throttle towards the ground solar minimum. So this will be happening. And um, they also declared that cycle 25 will be weakest in the past 200 years, uh, so on. So again, comparison, remember uh, El Gore, given that the 
Arctic ice will disappear by 2020. Well, this is Arctic ice 2012 and 2013 increased area much more and now increasing very dramatically. And you know that in the Russian part of Arctic, many ships are frozen into the ice because they believe that it will be global warming and send the ships and it was actually very cold there. So now some ships are frozen into the ice. They need some specific ice breaking devices to free their ships. So this is the thing which, which is happening. Of course, it is related to the interaction between what comes from the sun through the heating and exchange of this heat with the ocean. So ocean and water is the main uh, delivery guys which absorb the heating and then produce back into the atmosphere. And this is where the guys um, modeling the terrestrial atmosphere say temperature, they say this is where global warming come up. We come to back to this one a bit later, but what, um, uh, what I would say that all this uh, El Nino uh, and El Nino um, events, they will show obviously the number of female type events, which called cooling will be more frequently after 2025, 2028. So it will be cooling coming to the atmosphere. So what, yeah, this, I will stop this one. The, this is the part we investigated that volcanoes also will produce a little bit more. Okay, I will show you probably this one. That not only jets which are formed, um, as, as I shown, it was discovered by Schindler et al. 2008, that the jet system is affected by uh, coming to ground solar minimum, but also volcanic eruptions. So in here, with the blue one, these are the volcanic frequencies. And the red one, this is my summary curve, which I just shown you, we calculated for the years shown here. And we normalize that, that minimum and maxima coincide. Uh, so volcanic maxima coincide with the maxima of um, magnetic field with southern polarity. And what we found that correlation between this curve with the southern polarity maximum actually 84%. So basically, when magnetic polarity of sun solar magnetic field become southern, we will have a lot of volcanic eruption. Why it is relevant? Because it will happen in cycle 26. So apart from those jets, we will have much more volcanic eruptions and ashes, which probably will contribute to the further cooling of our atmosphere. So this is the thing which is upon us. And this is why the people need a lot of energy resources. We need to resolve the problem and probably stop <laughs> blaming fossil fuel and em embrace it because we need as much heating as you need because it will be snowing. It might be snowing in June. It might be some years when we will, will not have summer at all. So this is why we need, we need to have fuel and um, come with the, come prepared to the ground solar minimum, which is upon us, which will occur 2020, 2053. And this is very unique event none of the generation observe it. So we are in very unique position. We have so many instruments we can record step by step how it's happening. And whoever criticizes our prediction, I say we are in the middle of it. So we record it within 10 years, we will know who is right. If I'm wrong, you can blame, all right, you were like Cassandra predicting the bad while well, it didn't happen or if i am right we need to predict and uh, protect many families from not only from cold okay you can heat your houses inside but you need to produce food for those people for animals 
And if it is will be snowing in the northern hemisphere in Europe and Africa, then you need to produce this food somewhere else. You need in Europe, in America, you cannot produce it, then you need to produce it in Africa and some other countries, um, in African countries. So this is what uh, become an essential issue and not exactly agenda, which is fully propagated global warming. We need to produce cooling. Global warming will come. This is another issue. But for the next 30 years, we need a lot of energy. We need to produce food. This is the thing. Uh, so, I do have a question. There was what they called a year without a summer, right, in the 1800s. And uh, yeah. was that caused by a solar activity? And then that changes, changed volcanic activity? Uh, it was the, the year without summer, as far as I know, it was the um, eruption of large volcano, which uh, produced a lot of ashes. And um, basically, they covered, the ashes covered us from the solar radiation, which, again, another evidence is as, as soon as you cover yourself up with the sun, if energy coming from the sun stop coming to the earth, nothing from inside the earth can heat the atmosphere. So we are super confident assuming that we are heating atmosphere from inside. They claim that if you switch off the sign, we keep running because we heat ourselves from inside. It is nonsense. And this nonsense came from this particular picture. Have you seen it before? I have, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is what they said. It was in the early times, hold a sec. So this is the solar activity here, solar cycles and solar uh, irradiance. And this is the temperature variation. And so far until probably 80s, 90s, the temperature follow the variation of solar irradiance coming from solar activity. And then only here, they started moving the solar activity from cycle 21, started reducing, while the temperature is still increasing, and it is real increase. Of course, um, this increase, this is what some people from this modeling, they wanted to find some mechanism which can heat and the only thing they came up with this co2 emission that can heat planet from inside assuming that sun has nothing to do with us and we heat from inside if uh, volcanic ashes cold us winter in the summer it means that if we don't have radiation we cannot hit ourselves. We cannot do this. This is the thing. And uh, but at that time they didn't have any ideas what could hit. And this is why they came up. And you had the interview, I think, with uh, uh, Patrick Moore, who say that CO two cannot be bad gas heating because. This is the gas which is used to increase the greeneries. They use CO2 in garden centers yeah. to improve greeneries for people to buy very nice and bright greens. So increase of CO2 is not so bad for the earth and it cannot hit the earth. It, the CO2 increase is a consequence of heating and not the reason for it. Well, I just I want to show. We found the reason, but before I show, I want to give you. Just like, I'll come back to that one because the <laughs> no, I cannot do this. The radiation in CO two is infrared, which it means that wavelength is so low, um, is, is so big. It's the ten thousand meters or something i don't remember exactly a frequency is so low that the energy produced by this radiation is negligible so the main energy comes from the uv emission of the sun yeah you understand that that makes sense mm -hmm. uv emission it is um, h nu nu is high so 
the wavelength is one angstrom or even tenth of angstrom for gamma rays, which means that frequency is huge. And this is the emission which comes from the sun, UV emission, and hitting the earth. So why, if the solar activity is decreasing, where this emission come from? So they, they assume UV emission stop. The only UV emission come from the solar activity. But what we did, we published paper in 2019. So based them, we didn't know this problem they had with it. By that time, I didn't look at them, uh, how exactly uh, they come up with the heating with global warming. But we done further investigation of our magnetic field. So we look, you know, remember we have a formula. So we calculated this formula from 2000 to 10,000 before Christ. And when you build this, you see that I put this vertical lines, you see that the patterns formed by uh, grand solar cycles are very similar. A approximately five grand solar cycles have similar patterns. Do you see? Do you see this? Yeah. Yep. yep. More or less. Mm -hmm. So some cycles are narrow, like this one. Some are extended and long, and they extended and long in each of those. So what we discovered? Well, it's like very similarities. So what we did. We decided, okay, let's come back to our 11 year cycle, 22 year cycle. So we calculate average of 22 years. So where is the zero line? So if the cycle knew any shifts, everything which is increased and decreased for the positive polarity should be the same, which increased and decreased for the negative polarity. So if you add them together, your zero line should be at the line zero, right? Are you with me? I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we added this and what we did, we calculated the baseline and we discovered that the baseline, the zero line, actually it is no zero line. It oscillates by the factor 20, by the amplitude 20 times lower than solar cycle but it still oscillates and very oscillations are very precise so they're not changing much the period about 2000 2100 years and the same period lasts for we calculated 120000 years and the same period lasts for, for forever so this what zero light oscillates so basically it waves why zero line would wave? Would do you have any guesses why it would wave? I don't know. We measure magnetic field from the earth. So this zero line would wave if we with the earth moving towards the sun or from it. This is what the oscillation of the zero line indicates there is some um i would say planetary motion or solar motion or whatever so some orbital motion which produces because the period is very strict so it cannot be done on the sun itself when on the sun we remember when we done on the sun the curve is not so nice um uh, cosine like remember it, it is much more uh, disturbed so it doesn't look like a sign. This one looks very, very precise, cosine function. So when we look how the solar radiance changes in the past uh, 10,000 years, they also show these oscillations with the 2,100 year period. This is what, what we found. And then we read that it is so-called Halstead cycle of 2,200 years, which they discovered in the oscillation of solar irradiance in the uh, biomass of the trees and radio in the tops in the earth. So 2,000 year cycles. And we found this is because the oscillation of the zero line. So something changes 
the distance between sun and earth. So after that, we thought, okay, where we are now in which, in this cycle. So when you put, so this is the cycle more than one. The, this is this big oscillation of the baseline. And it turned out we are here. So it turned out that the minimum of the current cycle was during Mount the minimum. And now the magnetic field keep increasing towards the southern, towards the southern, yeah, to the, towards the northern polarity. So this is the thing like here, and this is the inclination of this curve. So when we impose the solar radiance, basically the solar radiance and variation of the zero line go together. So they coincide with the same uh, in slope and the same timing. So basically what we thought, aha, uh -huh, this should be that the sun and earth come somehow close as the earth obtains a little bit more um, radiation from the sun and magnetic field become higher because earth become closer to the sun. So this definitely could cause increase of the temperature because the sun become closer. But how does it happen? We In this paper, we only suggested in one paragraph that the sun become closer to the earth and this is why we have increase of the radiation and possibly temperature. The wave response from the people from energetic global warming was overwhelming. They eaten alive our paper. They produced a lot of um, uh, reviews uh, beneath the paper. They the editor produced a um, review after the publication. So eventually, the anthropogenic global warming people, they retracted this paper saying that the sun cannot move close to the earth. This is incorrect. Only on this basis that the sun cannot move towards theirs. This is not correct. And this is, so they retracted the paper. And at that time, it was uh, 4th of March, 2020. And we, in 20 days, we went into the uh, COVID lockdown. So I had plenty of time. So I did download the ephemeris of the uh distances between sun and earth so i look back what i have education in astronomy so i'm not afraid of calculating <laughs> and understanding motion so this is our planetary system sun is here so with basically i look at the different milankovitch cycles none of them can be helpful because the periods from 15000 to 41000 years and our period was only 2000 years. So none of them are suitable. So what I look was suitable turn out to be solar inertia motion. So the motion that not only sun attracts the planet, so they rotates around the sun uh, uh, following the Kepler law. But when Kepler invented the law, Newton still did not discover gravitation. It was only a few decades later he discovered. So no one included the background effect how the planets affect the sun. In this case, what happens that the sun basically, the old planets of the solar system, they basically do not rotate around the sun. They rotate about the center of Earth's sun system which is called body center and this sun also rotates around the same body center but a much smaller orbit and this is called solar inertial motion so here is example of solar inertial motion so this is solar orbit simulator this is not invented by me it's done by people doing celestial mechanics this is you can find on the internet which shows how the sun moves around this body center and the distance in which it moves is about two radius of the sun so diameter is about four solar radius so pretty large distance 
And this is the distance is called solar inertial motion. So all the planets rotate about the body center and the sun rotates about the body center. What is happening, like in here, your sun should be sitting in the center or in the focus because it is ellipse is sitting in the focus in one of the focuses of uh, the Earth's orbit, elliptical orbit. But when you include the solar inertial motion and the used paper from Nina Kuznetsov, who calculated this solar inertial motion, so your sun has to be moving like this. So it's not sitting in this dot, but it moves up to here, which shows you that in some period, sun will be closer to the Earth in some period. And at this stage in 2020 and the next um, four, 500 years, the sun will is closer to the Earth during the days of spring equinox in March and this time. So this is why the sun, so if we have spring equinox up here, so the sun closer to the Earth from February until June and much further from the Earth in other months. So it means during this time, the Earth gets much more heating than it would have if the sun was sitting in the focus of the uh, elliptical orbit. Are you with me? I am. Yeah, okay. Yep, yep. Let's move on. So. What mm -hmm. objection I got from anthropogenic global warming people, they said, oh, no, 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 the Earth moves together with the sun. They can deny that the sun has inertial motion because it's been calculated. And the effect that the star has inertial motion is the basis how the people look for exoplanets. As soon as they see this, um, you know, wobbling star with wobbling radiance, they know they, they should have planetary system. So this is well-known effect in astrophysics, but only in solar terrestrial physics, they decided to ignore. So this is what by um, the guy, uh, Professor Ken Rice, who said, no, 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 if this is the motion of the sun with the yellow, the motion of the earth is exactly following the sun uh, in this inertial motion. This is what he said to me. And uh, um, the comments beneath retracted paper, these are the numbers. So when we went on lockdown, I started investigating distances, all celestial um, motion. So these are, find the formula. And I found that it could not change the orbit. So if Earth would be moving, like Ken Rice says, Still, the changes of um, irradiance which come from the sun will not be covering what we observe. So what I did, I went on the website to Paris Madden Observatory, which produced mm. the ephemeris of sun-earth distances and compared them with the similar ephemeris produced by NASA. They are accurate within seven digits after coma. So then, I produced these distances in here for previous millennium from 600 for 1600 and from 1600 for 2600. So these are the distances, daily distances every month. What you see, the distance between sun and earth is decreasing January, February, March in both millennia and much more decreasing in, in the current millennium. So if in the previous millennium, it decreases maximum about 0.006 astronomical unit. For this millennium, the decrease of the distance um, between let's 1600 blue one and 2600 will be about 0.011 uh, 
thousands of astronomical units, which is a pretty large change. So this is why the distance is decreasing. So like in that picture, because the sun moves closer. So this is, you see the uh, June, May, May and June. This is the, when the distance is maximally decreasing. If the distance between sun and earth decreasing, it means that we get more radiation because our boiler come closer to, uh, to the earth in March to June, right? You see that? I do. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, what is beautiful, it turned out that, remember we have a, a summer solstice, which should be 21st of um, um, June. June or winter solstice, 21st of December. So what you can see that in previous millennium, it approached and passed. So it was uh, probably in 1100, it was 21st of June, but then it started moving towards the end of June. And for current millennium, actually, the summer solstice, look at that. We had this year, we had summer solstice actually come on the 5th of July. 5th of July. So the shortest distance was actually uh, on the 5th of July, not 21st of June. So this is why we have extra more radiation because the more sun come, it is closer to us in July. So we have this extra between 21st of June and 5th of July. We have extra radiation coming to us, which should not come. But because the sun is closer, it's coming to us. This is why we have extra heating. Do you see it? I do. Yeah. But hmm. so this is why we have this extra heating, which is deposited into the ocean, which consumes it and takes a while to return it. But because the sun is closer to this part of the orbit in March and June, it is further from the orbit in January and in the autumn. So if you look what happened in January in this millennium, so our winter solstice are also somewhere in the fifth, sixth, and for 2,600 years, our winter solstice will be on the 16th of actually 16th of January. So what we will have extra three weeks of heating. And this is why the temperature will be increasing until 2600 uh, years. And then the sun will start returning back because of its um, inertial motion to the um, focus of the elliptical orbit. And this distance become uh, increasing again. So this is what I discovered. Then what I did, I, uh, and the, uh, it is published in the chapter of the book, which I published in March 2021. So all these results are already published, so you can read them. Uh, it is a hard copy book, and it's published electronically. And if you go on my website for the 2021, it is a link to this book, which I show how much the distance changes. So you, you can see exactly the differences between. So you see the differences between uh, 1600 and 2600 is about 11, 0, 0. 0.6 or 11, um, 11 oh. thousands of astronomical units, which is huge distance exactly to to account for the heating we obtain now. So the temperature increase by 1.5 degree, it's actually in line with the increase of heating because sun become closer between month and minimum and now. So I calculated and the, what we show. So what, uh, this is how the distances change. So just to recapture, if um, you don't have in the previous millennium, 600, 1600, we didn't have um, effect of the solar inertial motion. So your solar solstice in June and the curves are more or less uh, 
like symmetric. It's slightly decreasing, but not much. But in the current millennium, my solar solstice, uh, the summer solstice changed to June, so the to July. So this is where we got extra heating, and obviously this is causes heating and will last until twenty six hundred. And uh, so what I try to present here, so instead of keeping sun on this uh, central point in the center of focus, your sun is shifted and distance the earth does not move with the sun, obviously, because ephemeris are official published by NASA and by Medon Observatory and they're exactly the same within seven digit after coma. So whatever Mr. Rice declared is not correct. So I was correct. It was my anticipation in the paper 2019 that should happen. They corrected that, oh yeah, they, they don't know celestial mechanics and Mr. Rice was specialist in celestial mechanics, but it turned out he's not right. NASA said you should be checking the real ephemeris. So we've proven indeed the distances are changing. And uh, if distances are changing, we can use inverse squared law and calculate how the radiation will be changing. So the, the radiation coming from the sun will be intensity of emission on the sun divided by square of distance. So, and here I presented how this um, radiation changing and you can clearly see that if this is 600 by 1600, the radiation coming from the sun increasing. And this is for previous millennium, 600 to 1600, and much more increasing for 1600 to 7600. So increasing very dramatically by three, 3.5, 4 point percent. This is why we have this heating. So in that book, I did estimation that the heating will come extra another two degrees from, from now until 26. It will be 2.5 degrees increase. And uh, whatever we can do on the Earth, we can stop it because this is the orbital motion. The sun is coming towards us and nothing horrible will happen because the Earth had this million times. Remember this uh, cycle, we got 120,000 years, the oscillations of the baseline. For 120,000 years, the Earth had this oscillation and managed to survive. And the last time we had heating, it was during Roman Empire, when uh, in Scotland they grew grapes and they had the stone, sunny stone bath in Scotland because it was so hot. So probably we head into that particular um, period. And after that, 2600, the sun start moving back toward the um, uh, focus of the ellipse and the temperature become decreasing for the next thousand years. So this basically, um, again, it is in the book. If you look at the book, you can look how solar irradiance is changing and to show you demonstration annual variation of solar irradiance in 616 and 1700 to 60. Again you can see that the input of solar radiation in the early months is not compensated by output in the eight, later months in the year. Furthermore what I did I calculated annual TSI variations during these two millennia. So if I take average per month radiation for each year, the increase of uh, annual radiance will be about one or two um, watt per square meters, which was exactly what um, anthropogenic global warming people predict because they use the average heating per month. But you can't use average heating because 
as I shown from um, graphs, the variation over the months are not distributed normally. So what we need, we need to use the total heating coming from uh, the sun during the whole month. So if I use the total heating, I discovered okay. that input from the sun is not one to what per square meter, it's about 20, 25 watt per square meters. And this is why we have this heating in this millennium. And after 25,000, the heating will be decreasing. So I found this extra heating which comes and it comes from the sun and not from the internal. So maybe it comes something from internal. I did not consider it at all. But what I found that very easily heating could come from the sun because sun moves closer to the earth during the spring equinox and uh, this uh, all spring and summer months. This is why we have uh, extra heating. So there's extra solar forcing called by gravitation of planets, which is a likely reason of the main part of global warming. Huh? Okay. Hello? A very, very, very good stuff. Uh, this might be a good stopping point, or do you have uh, other points you'd like to make before we wrap up here? Yes, what I wanted, mm -hmm. uh, when I look at that, I thought, I can't believe that people, none of the people guess that um, CO2 cannot heat. And I found this paper by Hardy, who actually calculated that if you increase the heating from the sun only by five watt per square meter, immediately comes that solar warming of the past century increases by 60%. And then the rest come from uh, internal warming, like they assume uh, only 40%. But remember, I found that we have heating by about 20 watt per square meter. So definitely people suspecting this, but Hardy was working at that time full time. He couldn't calculate the full 20, 25 watt per square meter. Now he's retired and he's putting forward the correct calculations. So basically uh, people realizing that the heating couldn't come anywhere only from our boiler and our main boiler is the sun. We cannot heat ourselves from inside. It would be great if we could, but unfortunately it is not the case. And um, this is my um, my point. But I will um, probably try. I try to understand how they come up with this erroneous. How they can get this energy coming from CO two. So one thing they didn't include the correct heating, but they found something from CO two which produces this heating. And th they need to do some errors. And I needed to look what errors they produce. And turn out they did not include the radiative transfer. And here this curve which I wanted to show you. So this is UV emission when it's strong emission. This is your CO2. It is tiny, tiny, tiny energy. You have to have a lot of the CO2 to produce anything. What this guy did, indeed, that they have CO2, the number of atoms on the line of sight is about 400. It is optical thickness. And they added all the emission from come from this atom that like it is comes back to the planet. But with radiative transfer, here would happen. So if your optical thickness less than one, your emission is added, you do straight line. But if your optical thickness is greater than one, it becomes saturated. So it cannot be added. This is their main error. The added emission, which basically should be self-absorbed and not seen. So I found why, how they managed to do explanation CO2. And we found that the energy comes from the sun again. So this is the thing. This is my point. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, any other points you'd like to make? Well, so 
I believe that uh, it will not be dangerous with the global warming, given that we cannot do much. We just need to adopt it. The main problem will be in the next 30 years, this ground solar minimum, because when it is snowing and it, no food growing, it will be much more difficult to survive. So this is the thing which we want to, I want to emphasize. So this yeah. is it. Okay. And over the next 30 years, uh, this will become undeniable, right? As we look at the satellite data, for example. Yes, it will become not even 30, maybe five years only. We need to survive this uh, grand solar minimum, grand solar maximum, not grand. Maximum of cycle 25 we are now. So cycle 25 has maximum 24, 25. So we are at the maximum of uh, current solar cycle when we have many uh, loops, despite the number of sunspots is reducing, but they're still generating these uh, loops and uh, they're generating flares and generating emission. As soon as we move from maximum and come into the descending phase, this is what we will be having reduction of heating coming from the sun because activity on the solar surface will be re reduced and this uh, ground solar minimum will come. So for our generation, this global warming is not essential. The main thing is this ground solar minimum, which reduce uh, the temperature heating and um, reduction of production of food and everything. So this is the main thing. Okay, all right. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I very much enjoyed listening to this and I, I need to watch it through again and I get it put up on the internet, but thank you very much. You're very welcome. If you have any questions, you can look at the book chapter to verify the distances because these are not my calculation. These are calculations by done professionals who do from the sun. And I believe the people who do anthropogenic global warming, it was their task to check the ephemeris before declaring that the distances are not changing. They do change. And I wouldn't do this job if they wouldn't retract my paper. So it's my honor of the scientists was to prove that I was right. And this is what I managed to do. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you You're later. You're very welcome. Yep. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye-bye.